late at night. We're about to jump into where well, it's not late at night, but it's night. We're about to jump into some of these horror stories. Y'all know it's getting close to Halloween. It's my favorite time of the year. Hope y'all loving the setting back there. So strap on, y'all. We finna jump into this shit. But before we do that, what up, YouTube? It's your boy, RDS, and let's scare the shit out of you. All right, y'all, let's jump on this. All right. And by, uh, these stories are by Mr. Nightmare. I don't know if either one of y'all heard of this dude, but he tells terrific horror stories. This is 14 minutes and 22, 14 minutes and 22 seconds long. Uh, I think it's going to be three stories. Very disturbing, as you can see on his stain there. So if y'all are fans, you know, subscribe to Mr. Nightmare. Because I've been uh, watching his shit for quite a while now. This is my first time, so we're, do we're watching this together. So get ready to be scared. Let's go. And I'm going to keep this dark setting. So that wasn't on the second floor. My parents' house was a high ranch, so when you entered the house, it split off to two floors. One half flight of stairs going upstairs and one downstairs. The downstairs level had the den, the garage, my bedroom, and a bathroom. The other three bedrooms in the house were all upstairs. Since I grew up the oldest and the only boy in the house with two sisters, I got the room downstairs because it was the biggest and technically the coolest room. After I turned 10, my parents gave my twin bed to my little sister and I got a full-size bed, which was a bit of an upgrade because the room was big and could certainly fit a bigger bed. When I was 12, my little sisters were around 5 and 8, so at this age I would be allowed home alone, but my 5-year-old sister wouldn't be left alone with me, and my 8-year-old sister would only be left alone with me if my parents weren't going to be gone for too long. If they'd be gone for longer periods of the day, then one of my parents would take both of my sisters. For this short period of time, I'd say like three nights in a row, maybe a little more, I was waking up in the middle of the night for no reason, and I'd have trouble falling back asleep, considering I was- Sure, I got that problem right now. One is I'm getting visited by people, you know what I'm saying? By ghosts, by spirits. You know, I got the Ouija board over there, so that ain't helping it at all, y'all. 12 years old, I knew I shouldn't have been having sleeping problems at that age. I was sleeping with the fan on next to my bed because it was a hot couple of days in the middle of the summer, so I wasn't sure what exactly was waking me up considering the fan provided a steady white noise. One of these nights, I got up after waking up to refill my glass of water. I went to the bathroom right outside my bedroom, and as I was filling it up, I thought I heard something come from inside my room. I turned off the faucet and then listened, but now there was nothing, just the sound of the fan. I walked to the doorway in my bedroom. And I couldn't tell what it was, but something was creeping me out about my room now. I went upstairs to the living room and decided to sleep on the couch that night. I fell asleep eventually, but that same night, again, I woke up, this time to noises from the kitchen. I saw the glow of the light from the fridge and the sounds of someone rummaging through it. The way that floor was set up had the kitchen out of view from the couch in the living room. I couldn't see who was there. I heard the fridge door eventually- That's some scary shit that your kitchen is out of view from the, you know, from the uh, living room to the kitchen, you really can't see who's in the kitchen. So to hear your refrigerator open and, shit, and hear like rattling noises inside of your fridge, things moving around, that have got to be the scariest shit ever, especially if you're by yourself and you a kid. I don't know, I would've, that would've been it, I would've been out of that motherfucker. There ain't no way in hell. I would've tried to go take no peek, no look, no nothing. Do y'all get me? I'm out of there. ...shut, then footsteps walk away and downstairs. Oh, hell no. I was drowsy, and so I went back to sleep. What? I believe it was the next day that my mom was folding clothes in my room, and she told me my room stunk, and I needed to clean up whatever that smell was. I ignored her because I really didn't smell anything. I wish I didn't ignore her, though. They're coming straight in. Trust me. I've got... That night, our dad put the air conditioning on because it was simply too hot. 
After we all watched a movie as a family, everyone started getting ready for bed. I went to my room and played video games for a little while before getting sleepy. By that time, I turned off the TV and console and rolled on my side to go to sleep like I always did. Tonight I didn't have the fan on because the air conditioning was on, so there was just the sound of the air blowing out from the vents in the ceiling. I fell asleep, but once again I woke up not long after. I didn't know what the sound I heard was, all I heard was the vent fan blowing air. Then when it stopped blowing air, the room was silent and I heard something. Breathing. But it wasn't my breathing though. I looked around the room. The closet door was shut, so there was no way it was coming from there. Part of my childlike innocence assumed it was my younger sister playing a prank. I got on the floor and looked the one place I could think to look. Under the bed. I lifted the little piece of cloth that dangles at the bottom of the bed, and there was a very large person laying underneath my bed on a pile of blankets. Their head was facing me, but their eyes were closed. I fell backwards and basically crab walked out of the room screaming dad. I heard my parents door swing open and my parents yelling in concern. I pointed into my room and said under the bed and my dad went and pulled out this very large dirty looking man. I remember my dad quite easily physically forcing the man outside as my mom called 911. I'm sure he went to jail for a while or maybe not because he was homeless who knows. This did a lot of mental damage to me where I didn't even want to sleep in my own room anymore, or let alone in that house. I had to sleep in the middle of my parents for a while. Then my dad installed security cameras all over the house. We threw out everything that was opened in the fridge because we had no idea what he put his mouth on in there. The fear of someone being under my bed stayed with me for a long time, years to come. We don't even know how long he was hiding under my bed, it could have been a few days. The smell, the person going through the fridge, the randomly waking up every night for a few days. Whether he meant harm or not, having someone hiding under your bed is every child's biggest nightmare. My name is like Squidward, and I hate my life. It ain't just the kids' nightmare. Adults be scared of that shit too. It ain't no way in hell if I'm a kid and that shit happened, I'm never sleeping alone again. Ever. Why would your parent even want you to sleep alone again after some shit like that? I would want my kid with me every single night. Fuck that. Yeah, hell no. This story is from my great-grandfather, who is currently at the ripe old age of 101. He's told this story at family gatherings for years. He's from the city of Yaroslavl in Russia. I guess it So this is the type of story you tell at a family gathering? A horror story? Okay. Okay. Was the Soviet Union when he was born there. Being from the USSR, of course he served under the Soviet Union during World War II, then fleeing to the United States a few years after to escape communism. He told me this story again recently. It happened not long after the Battle of Veliki Luki, which wasn't a major battle of the war, but it still ended up in a large amount of Soviet and German bloodshed, as most battles at the time did. It was the evening, and according to my great-grandfather, it was very cold that night, like hellish cold. They were in a small house slash building that was one of the few with no damage to it, which made it nice because it was warm. Him and his comrades were celebrating with drinks, songs, laughing and joking, what you could imagine a celebration would look like. At some point in the evening, two fellow soldiers walked into the building. My great-grandfather and his friend Sergei didn't care for these two. It was apparently because they were loudmouths and were just unpleasant guys. Sergei asked my great-grandfather if he wanted to go out and have a smoke. He agreed, and the two put on their heavy coats and walked out into the freezing cold air. My great-grandfather pulled out a cigarette, as did Sergei, and then he lit both of their cigarettes. They were talking for a while, both enjoying their cigarette and basking in the glory that came along with winning the battle that had been going on for about two months. After my great-grandfather finished his cigarette, they were both about to go back inside when they heard what sounded like a man scream from the woods in the distance. Fearing that it was the scream from one of their comrades, possibly being attacked by a patrol of pissed off Germans, they went back inside quickly and grabbed their guns. Because of the fact that there might be armed Germans, they got a bunch more of their fellow soldiers to run into the woods with them. My great grandpa mentioned that as he got deeper into the woods, he started to get a weird feeling, like dread and fear. When they couldn't hear screaming anymore, 
My great grandpa suggested that they all split into duos and search for whoever it was. Sergei went with him while the others went off in their own duos. So After you about you tell me you hear screaming late at night when it shouldn't be no one out there, even though he's saying it could be an insurgents, whatever you want to call them. Uh, you run out there, and then next thing you know, the further you get, you don't hear any screaming. For one thing, it should be no screaming at that time of night. It's fucking cold as shit outside, and it's just it shouldn't be no one out there screaming because it shouldn't be nobody even out there. And then the screaming just stops. Once again, I'm out of there. Comrades, friends, family, I'm gone. Either y'all coming with me or you're staying. Simple as that. Two minutes of walking through the dark, cold woodlands. My great grandpa said that he could hear faint crying, like someone was in pain. Sergey heard this too, so they walked to where they heard the crying sounds. They started seeing drops of blood in the snow. So they both began to take the situation as more of a threat than they were earlier. It still gives me chills when my great grandpa tells me this part. When him and Sergey got to the source of the crying sound, they had found the most bizarre and disturbing scene they had witnessed. Two German soldiers on the ground, one of them dead, one alive. One of them had their uniforms ripped and bloodied. The alive one was cowering by a tree, muttering stuff in German. He didn't notice my great grandpa and Sergey right away. My great grandpa then walked towards the other body. The corpse was horrifically mutilated, missing limbs, skin ripped off the face, his uniform was shredded and it looked like he had been scalped. Another thing that stood out to my great grandpa was the smell. He couldn't describe the smell, saying it wasn't like a dead body, but more like chemicals. The corpse looked fresh. Sergei investigated the living soldier, who then noticing Sergei, jumped back in terror as if he had been traumatized. He was shouting stuff in German. It was only then that my great grandpa noticed that his leg had been torn apart and his chest was bloody. He said he could remember that German screaming something like Das Kolas or something similar. Sergei pulled out his pistol and put the German out of his misery with a single shot to the head. Almost immediately after this, my great grandpa described hearing moaning like noises. And that's when a very tall thing started running in the darkness away from them. Afraid, Sergei and Great Grandpa started shooting erratically in the direction of the thing. The other men ran over, but the thing was gone. All of the men were reprimanded when they got back to the village, but a report was sent to the high command. It was never investigated further. My Great Grandpa claims that it was the most terrifying experience of his life. It makes him stressed when thinking back on the sight of that mangled German and that thing. Just this wasn't game. Terrifying. You're not ready for it. This happened when my fiance Morgan and I just moved into our house together in a quiet little town. We still live in this house. It's a modest, cute little house, perfect for us and a couple of kids. See, that's what I want to live in, a creepy house with an attic and a basement. For real. And a chute. I don't know, I just love houses like that. I've always been fascinated with houses like that. Even houses that's haunted. I would I live in that motherfucker. I'm not even joking. I'd probably be scared as shit. Like I say, I'd probably be out of there every single night, but I end up making my way back because that's where I live at. But I always want to live in a house like that. One day, hopefully I will. If and when we decide to have. We met one of the neighbors right off the bat. They seemed nice. They were an older couple in their late 60s. The neighbors on the other side were pretty far away, so we didn't meet them for a while. We were still in the unpacking and furnishing phase. It might have been week two of living in the house. We were exhausted by every night, having to work our jobs and then also setting up the house and unloading. Morgan was cooking pasta in the kitchen. I was sitting at the table talking to her while on my laptop shopping for area rugs. It was a little stuffy in the house, so I was going to go slide open the back door, but as I got to it. I looked into the backyard and noticed someone sitting in one of the chairs. He was kind of hunched over with his head down. When I say I almost shit myself when I saw it, I'm not kidding. I whispered Morgan's name and said, don't scream, but there's a man in the yard. She walked over to look outside and gasped. She grabbed me and kind of hid behind me and said, go say something. No wait, don't. Truth be told, I myself didn't know if I should go out there or not. I'm not the biggest man to be honest. And even though this being the biggest man are you fucking crazy 
it's a man, old man sitting in a fucking chair in your backyard. And you think that shit normal? Man, I don't these I don't get these fucking people. I know it's a story about Mr. Nightmare, but goddamn. This guy had his back to us and was sitting down. He looked like he was bigger than me. Morgan suggested I knock on the glass and yell at him to leave. I didn't want to do it though, I was scared. The backyard is huge, but right outside the backyard door is a patio with the leftover furniture. The lights in the yard weren't on. We just saw him through the interior lights shining through the glass door, which meant he had to know we were in here. I said fuck it, knocked on the glass and yelled, hey you need to get off our property. The man turned around and looked at me. He then got up with this half smile, almost like he was laughing. He looked 50. He had a really long gray beard and tattoos down to his wrists. He walked up to the glass. I made sure the door was locked. He stood on the other side of the glass door and shifted his gaze to Morgan. He started licking his lips and saying vile shit. I yelled, all right, I'm calling the police. I closed the sliding blind to get him out of our faces. I called 911 and told the operator to please hurry and send police to our house. I could still hear the man on the other side of the door, now speaking at a very high volume, almost yelling, still saying disgusting things about Morgan. I put the phone to the glass so the operator could hear it. He made me stay on the phone until police would show up. Eventually it went quiet outside, and so I took a peek out the glass and the guy was gone. Still, I couldn't wait for police to arrive, and when they did, they searched the backyard, took a police report, and left. We thought it was over. But later on that night, when we were in the living room watching TV, we both agreed we heard something from outside in the yard. I went over to the window and kinked the blind, just enough to see that man outside again. He had a cigarette in his hand. He was talking to himself, or trying to talk to us, facing the house. He noticed the kink in the blinds, because he ran over to the window. I jumped back, and he started pounding on the window, saying all these awful, sick things he wanted to do to Morgan. I told her to go upstairs, I didn't want her to hear this anymore. I yelled I'm gonna call the police again, and then the pounding stopped and he went silent. I waited a few seconds before kinking the blind again, and he was gone. I went upstairs to go comfort Morgan who was visibly shaken. I told her he was gone, when in hindsight I should have called the cops again. Downstairs I heard bumping and knocking. I went halfway down the stairs and heard bumps on the back door and the doorknob twisting and turning. He was trying to get into the house. I grabbed the phone in the kitchen and called 911 again, once again begging the operator to send police now. This time the police arrived a lot quicker and I didn't alert the man outside that they were coming. But unfortunately by the time they showed up, that man disappeared again. It's very likely he just ran off into the trees deep in the backyard. He didn't come back again that night. The next day. We went around knocking on neighbors' doors, both introducing ourselves to those we hadn't met yet and asking them if they knew anyone matching the description of that man. What we found out was disturbing. A couple a few doors down from us knew that man. He was known for beating his ex-wife and having a drinking and drug problem, and generally just regarded as very dangerous. He lived around the block from us in a small, run-down house, that's the scariest part. We reported him to the police, but since we didn't have him on video, we couldn't press charges. We don't know if he still lives there because we haven't heard from or seen him in a long time. I hope it stays that way. Hope it stays that way. Did I hear him say that shit? Pack your shit and get the fuck out of there. You mean to tell me... So the man didn't get caught because he wasn't on video. He showed up to your house more than once. And that second time, he damn near tried to get in because you heard the knob rattling. And you mean to tell me you all still, like, that couple still took a chance to stay there? So how can you even fucking go to sleep doing some shit like that? You never know. You can knock the fuck out. This man can break in your shit. Get the hell up out of there. A house, your life ain't worth. Ah, oh, fuck all that. I don't even know what to say because that shit is just stupid to me. So you still, these motherfuckers still decided to stay there. I mean, I know it's a story, and that one was a damn good one, but there's no way in hell me and my lady will be staying in that fucking house. I don't care if we got to go stay with a friend and live on a couch. That's where we're going to be at till we find another place to stay. Man. Well, I hope y'all enjoyed that shit, because that last one just fucked me all up in the head, for real. 
So until next time, uh, Mr. Nightmare, you did your thing again. Shout out to you. Like I said at the beginning, make sure y'all subscribe to Mr. Nightmare. You know, he's a good storyteller. I've been uh, listening to this man for some months now, and he tells some good stories, y'all, for real. So until next time, I hope y'all have nightmares tonight, and I hope you don't sleep good. I hope you get waking up by every single noise around you. For real.